A recent performance of Colin Murphy's play, The U.S. vs. Ulysses, reminds us of the struggle faced by Joyce and his supporters to educate us about the vital need to represent the body and all its functions in modern creative literature. Une récente représentation de la pièce de Colin Murphy, United States vs. Ulysses, nous rappelle la lutte menée par Joyce et ses partisans pour nous sensibiliser à la nécessité vitale de représenter le corps et presque toutes ses fonctions dans la littérature créative moderne. The first major obstacle faced by the book was the banning of serial publication in the Little Review in New York based on explicit reference to masturbation and the provocative, if unintended, charms of a young lady in Sandy Mount. Le premier obstacle majeur auquel le livre a été confronté a été l'interdiction de publication en série dans le Petit Review, or the Little Review, basé sur une référence explicite à la masturbation et au charme provocateur, bien qu'involontaire, d'une jeune femme de saint limont Paris, the Dijon printer and Sylvia Beach came to the rescue in 1922 with the first publication of the English language edition. Paris, l'imprimeur de Dijon et Sylvia Beach viennent à la rescousse en 1922 avec la première publication de l'édition en langue anglaise. Although the Weimar Republic had already permitted publication of the German translation, Nazi book burning began in May 1933, although not including Ulysses. Bien que la République de Weimar ait déjà autorisé la publication de la traduction allemande, Les nazis commencent, commencèrent à, à brûler les livres en, en mai 1933, sans toutefois inclure Ulysse. The victory of artistic insight delivered by U.S. Federal Judge Woolsey followed in December of that year. The extract which I have chosen details at least one common daily bodily function, defecation. At the end of the piece, I hope briefly to explain some of the names, references, and personal connections to the topographic setting of this piece from the end of Calypso. La victoire de la perspicacité artistique délivrée par le juge fédéral américain Woolsey a suivi en décembre de la même année. L'extrait que j'ai choisi détaille au moins une fonction corporelle quotidienne, et au presque quotidien, La défection, la défécation. À la fin de la pièce, j'espère expliquer brièvement certains noms, références et liens personnels avec le cadre topographique de cette pièce de la fin de Calypso. He kicked open the crazy door of the jacks. Better be careful to not get these trousers dirty for the funeral. He went in, bowing his head under the low lintel, leaving the door ajar amid the stench of mouldy lime wash and stale cobwebs. He undid his braces. Before sitting down, he peered through a chink at the up at the next door windows. The king was in his counting house. Nobody. A squat on the cuck stool, he folded out his paper, turning its pages over on his bared knees. Something new and easy. No great hurry. Keep it a bit. Our prize tidbit, Matcham's Masterstroke. Written by Mr. Philip Beaufoy. Playgoers Club, London. Payment at the rate of one guinea a column has been made to the writer. Three and a half, three pounds three, three pounds thirteen and six. Quietly he read, restraining himself, the first column, and yielding but resisting, began the second. Midway, 
his last resistance yielding, he allowed his bowels to ease themselves quietly as he read, reading still patiently, that slight constipation of yesterday quite gone. Hope it's not too big. Bring on piles again. No, just right. So. Ah, Kostiv. One tabloid of, of Cascara Sagrada. Life might be so. It did not move or touch him, but it was something quick and neat. Print anything now. Silly season. He read on, seated calm above his own rising smell. Neat, certainly. Matcham often thinks of the master stroke by which he won the laughing which now oh, begins and ends morally, hand in hand, smart. He glanced back through what he had read, and while feeling his water flow quietly, he envied kindly Mr. Beaufoy, who had written it and received payment of three pounds, thirteen and six. Might manage a sketch by Mr. and Mrs. L. Bloom, invent a story for some proverb, which time I used to try jotting down my cuff what she said dressing, just like dressing together, nicked myself shaving, biting her nether lip, hooking the placket of her skirt, timing her. 9.15. Did Roberts pay you yet? 9.20. What had Greta Conroy on? 9.23. What possessed me to buy this comb? 9.24. I'm swelled after that cabbage. A speck of dust on the patent leather of her boot, rubbing smartly and turn each welt against her stockinged calf. Morning after the bazaar dance when May's band played Ponchielli's Dance of the Hours. Explain that. Morning hours, noon, then evening coming on, then night hours. Washing her teeth. That was the first night. Her head dancing, her fan sticks clicking. Is that Boylan well off? He has money. Why? I know he had a good rich smell off his breath dancing. No use humming then. Allude to it. Strange kind of music that last night. The mirror was in shadow. She rubbed her hand glass briskly on the woolen vest against her full wagging bub. Peering into it. Lines in her eyes. It wouldn't pan out somehow. Evening hours, girls in grey gauze. Night hours then, black with daggers and eye masks. Poetical idea. Pink, then golden, then grey, then black. Still true to life also. Day, then the night. He tore away half the prize story sharply and wiped himself with it. Then he girded up his trousers, braced and buttoned himself. He pulled back the jerky, shaky door of the jacks and came forth from the gloom into the air. In the bright light, lightened and cooled in limb, he eyed carefully his black trousers the ends, the knees, the hocks of the knees. What time is the funeral? Better find out in the paper. A creak and a dark whir in the air high up. The bells of George's church. They told the hour. Loud, dark iron. Hey ho, hey ho. Hey ho, hey ho. Hey ho, hey ho. Quarter two. There again, the overtone following through the air. Third. Poor Dignam. So a little explanation. Philip Beaufoy, also known as Philip Beaufoy Barry, was born Zalek, 
Philip Bergson to his Polish-Jewish immigrant father, Michal Bergson, who moved from Poland to Switzerland to France and the UK in the 1860s, where Philip was born. He was a journalist, theatre critic, and a purveyor of melodramatic stories, with some success. He had a brother, full brother, who moved back to Paris in childhood, and he was raised as Henri Bergson, and he became a very famous philosopher and won a Nobel Prize in literature in 1927. So this is Eccles Street on the southwestern side, a terrace of reasonably preserved Georgian houses, one a rebuild where the arrow points to the door of my suite, which I now own and rent. And on the other side of the road, you can see a whole complex of hospitals, including the Matter Private and the Greater Matter Public. And there's my office there, and there's the church, so it's not far away. And the house where Bloom was would lie there at number seven. So even closer, as you can imagine, from the back garden, the bells from George's church would ring loud and clear, as they rang loud and clear in Carl Stevens' schoolroom as a child in Belvedere, just another block away. And this is the vantage point from which I did a little sketch about 17 years ago, having a cup of coffee, uh, it takes in the a sort of a oblique front of the George's Church and a building in front which is actually being renovated after a fire covered over with a screen. So there's a image, the spire, the church has been decommissioned or whatever is deconsecrated. And so let's fade out. So thank you very much. I'm sorry I was unable to project that during our meeting.